Mix Themes presented in our favorite genre. I'm your host, Nicole, and it's time to share another dark tale. Welcome to the very first episode of Kuroskuro Horror. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, whether you've followed the blog or you know me personally or you just stumbled across the podcast, I'm really glad you're here and I'm excited to nerd out with you and just talk about all the things in the world of horror. So um, before we dive in to what I want to talk about today, um, I'm just going to take a few minutes to tell you guys a little bit about myself. Um, I've been a horror lover ever since childhood. Um, My mom loves spooky stuff, and I think she recognized in me in an early age that I also loved spooky stuff. Um, When I was a really, really small child, like three years old, I remember her, you know, making my costumes and taking me trick-or-treating, and it was always a really big deal. And so as I got older, um, you know, I, I love to watch Ghostbusters cartoons and stuff like that and um, the very first horror movie I ever saw was with her Um, I saw Nightmare on Elm Street when I was five Um, and I also remember watching Poltergeist 3 at a young age it must have been around the same time but for some reason that was too scary like which sounds ridiculous but uh, I guess Freddy wasn't too scary but the like the silver balls flying through the mortuary were too scary so um But yeah, so she's really the one who kind of got me into the spookier things. And uh, she also, there were Stephen King books around the house. She's a big Stephen King fan. And so when I was, I honestly couldn't tell you how old I was the first time I read Stephen King. But I remember uh, reading Night Shift, the collection of short stories, when I was probably, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12. Uh, And so I'm also an avid King reader now. Um, I'm sure there'll be a whole episode about that one of these days, but... Um, and we were also, I was raised in a Christian home, which seems like kind of a weird thing. You know, I grew up with this horror and I also grew up with, you know, Christianity is a big part of my life and they're both still big parts of my life. So, uh, I'll talk more about that later. Um, I'd like to do, you know, an entire episode about, uh, religion and horror films and you'll hear a little bit of my, you know, Christian perspective leak into, uh, my views on horror from time to time, but uh, just kind of a, a weird kind of quirk, interesting thing about me in that regard. Um, if you hear a little bit of like jingling in the background, well, it's one of two things. It's either my dog walking around. Um, I have a Ruby Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, and she is a co-host on both this podcast and another podcast I'm a part of. Um, if it's not her little nails clicking, it's probably a glass of bourbon sitting next to me. Uh, My husband and I, we collect bourbon, and I usually have an old-fashioned by my side when I'm podcasting. So, uh, cheers. (laughs) But, um, you know, today I want to talk about the current state of horror, because when you're a horror nerd, like I am, and probably like you are, if you're listening to this podcast, um, you know, we always pay attention to horror and it's always a big deal to us and we're always excited about it but we're in a really interesting time in our culture right now where a lot of people are interested in it whether they're horror nerds or not um horror has phases where it's popular and where it's lame and right now we're living in like a golden age of horror where you know normies and basic people are watching the same stuff we're watching. Um, I've had a lot of people that I would not uh, ever have thought they were be, would be interested in such things asking me, you know, oh, what do you think about Stranger Things? What do you think about it? Are, are you watching Haunting of Hill House? And I'm like, oh, this person's watching the scary stuff, you know? Um, and it's, it's exciting. It's an exciting time to be a fan. Um, it seems like almost every network has a horror show. Um, You know, I think we're coming into a really interesting time for horror television because, uh, you know, Walking Dead has been out for a long time, probably close to 10 years by now, maybe not that long. But uh, I think it was probably the first 
like massively successful horror show. And the thing about Walking Dead, a lot of horror fans hate it at this point. I've I have not kept up with the latest two seasons, but you know, I think The Walking Dead was important because it's really a drama wrapped up in horror. You know, they put like a zombie facade on it, but really it's drama. And so I think that made Walking Dead more accessible for your casual viewer. Uh, American Horror Story is another one that, I mean, has been wildly successful, Um, which that show is so weird. I'm really surprised that people who aren't into horror like it, but I think that, um, you know, people liked Nip Tuck, people liked Glee, and then they gave American Horror Story a chance because it's the same creators and, you know, ended up finding something in there they liked. And I think it helps, too, that that show changes every season. So if you don't like one season, you're willing to tune in the next season. Uh, It's not like a show where... You know, it's the same story. So if you don't like one season, you're not going to tune in. You'll, you'll give it a chance every season. Um, and in the same vein, you know, you had Hannibal, which is also very stylized, like American Horror Story, um, but probably more well done. The story was better. Uh, the unfortunate thing about Hannibal is I think it was ahead of its time. It has a really rabid fan base among horror fans, but the ratings were terrible and it got canceled. Um, You know, I would love to see what Hannibal would do in our current climate, just because I think that there's, you know, fertile ground there. People are more willing to give things like that a chance, Um, which, you know, there are rumors floating around that we're gonna get a season four one way or another. Um, You know, I don't know, we'll see, I would love that. But also, I don't know if, if like, the magic is gone. Um, But, you know, we'll be looking out for that. And um, I think the last couple of years is really where horror has, like, hit its stride. Um, Stranger Things was another big one. Uh, which Stranger Things, you know, you can debate that. It's not really horror. It's, it's, it's like a genre melting pot, if you will. You've got sci-fi, you've got nostalgia, you've got a little bit of drama. It's got some horror elements. Um, it's really accessible to a lot of people. Families can even watch it together, which if you can find a horror property that families can watch together, I mean, that's gold. That's like Gremlins. You know, you're talking uh, some really rare things that are good and also accessible to a lot of people. And I think Stranger Things really tapped into that magic that is so rare. Um, And, you know, Stephen King, again, was a huge influence on Stranger Things. The Duffer brothers that made Stranger Things wanted to make it, weren't given the opportunity. And so they did Stranger Things instead which is funny because I think Stranger Things is part of the reason why it was so successful. You've got this group of kids. You even have one of the same actors in both properties. But you've got this group of kids who are really the protagonists, who are really endearing and brave, and you know they're overcoming the monster. So the stories are really very parallel, and they're even set in the same decade, um, which is very interesting. Um, but the success of Stranger Things followed by the success of it has really shown that horror can be profitable. And I mean, throughout the decades, one of the reasons why people make horror films is because they're profitable. They're low budget. They're all almost always low budget. A studio can crank out a horror film with a little bit of money and usually see a pretty healthy return on investment. And I think that's maybe why we have like, you know, 10 sequels to our favorite properties because the studios are like, yeah, people will come see this. We don't even have to put that much money or energy into it, which is both a good and a bad thing (laughs) because do we really need like Hellraiser part 12? Probably not, but do we want to say goodbye to Pinhead? Not really. So So we have this sort of like push and pull, love, hate thing going on with that. But... um, Again, being a lifelong horror fan, I think I recognize when we're in the really good times, but I had really, I think, a wake-up call during 
the Oscars in February um, because the day they came out with the nominations and Get Out and The Shape of Water were nominated for the big awards and multiple awards, I thought, what world are we living in? (laughs) Because horror and comedy do not get nominated for Academy Awards, and they certainly don't win Academy Awards. So, I mean, I pay attention to the Oscars, but I usually don't watch it. Um, And I don't have cable, but I found a way to watch the Oscars. So um, I was just so excited to see Shape of Water win Best Picture, which, full disclosure, I still have not seen Shape of Water. I admittedly am like pretty behind. I'm not up on the most recent stuff. It just, you know, you only have the time and money to go to so many movies in the theater, especially when like my husband likes some horror movies, but I'm not gonna drag him to every horror movie. And then, I mean, and then when they come out to rent, I mean, there's just, there's so many movies. It's just really hard to keep up. Um, So I still haven't seen The Shape of Water, but I will. I've seen Get Out twice, it's fantastic. Um, but anyway, as Sophia would say, I digress. So when that happened, I was like, okay, something's going on. And, you know, admittedly, you could tell when you watch the Oscars this past year that Hollywood is making an effort to recognize, I don't want to say minorities, but that's the best way I can say it. So they recognize people of different ethnicities, people of different gender, genres that are normally overlooked were kind of all represented at the Oscars this year. Um, So I do think it was a strategic move. I think they were like, okay, we usually only nominate certain genres in a certain niche. We're gonna go outside that. We're gonna look for things that are excellent, but are outside the norm. Um, And I kind of expected it to be forced and cheesy because I suspected that's what was happening, especially since Guillermo del Toro is Mexican and Jordan Peele is black. I thought, is this the only reason why these movies are getting nominated? I think it is partially, but I think it's also because these movies are excellent. So they said, let's get out of our box. Let's look at things that are different. Let's look at genres that are different. Let's look at filmmakers that are different. And let's recognize their excellence. And I think that's what happened. And that's why um, The Shape of Water won. Because, I mean, Guillermo del Toro is a powerhouse. I mean, he's a talented filmmaker. He's made several exceptional films. So his recognition was totally deserved. And Jordan Peele, here he is. He's done mostly comedy. Um, I haven't really tapped into any of his comedy, but I've heard nothing but good things about it. He comes along, first-time director, goes outside his wheelhouse, does horror, which he's a horror fan, he respects the genre, and knocks it out of the park. Um, So it was just a really stellar moment, I think, for horror fans, for, you know, nerd filmmakers, for a lot of people. Um, And that's when I really realized that, like, something is changing, culture has really started to embrace our weird little corner of the world. And, you know, part of me is really excited about it. And part of me is like, oh, but like, this is ours. We want to protect it. We don't want to share it. (laughs) Um, But honestly, I mean, I think it can't be anything but good for us. Will it last? No. Um, But I think we really have to be excited about where we are and embrace it. Because when horror is popular, we're going to get bigger budgets. We're going to get bigger audiences. We are going to get bigger name directors that have more talent that are going to come bring something new to the genre. Um, So I think it's really exciting. And um, I think partially because of the success, the mainstream success of properties like Stranger Things and Get Out and The Shape of Water, we will start seeing, you know, horror elevated to a more serious art form, which we have always known that horror is a more serious art form, but I think it will start to be taken more seriously by other people outside our little horror family, Um, like Suspiria. I haven't seen Suspiria yet, but that movie looks pretty artsy, 
you know, I think it's going to kind of not make sense, which I'm totally down for. Um, you see movies like Hereditary that deal with some really serious human complex situations and emotions. Um, and I think it's going to introduce horror to a whole new audience. They might look at it a different way and not just think that it's like dumb slashers, which no offense to slasher genre. I like slashers. Um, and then you look at something like The Haunting of Hill House, which, you know, Shirley Jackson's novel is a jewel in the crown of horror. It's supposed to be like one of the scariest things ever written. Um, it's inspired a lot of people in the horror genre, authors and filmmakers. And so a talented director like Mike Flanagan comes along, takes the story, makes it his own, does an exceptional job, minus the ending, that ending man. But it was still fantastic. I don't care if I didn't personally like the ending. The show was fantastic. Um, And again, like I feel like the horror nerds knew that show was coming, but a lot of the general audience didn't. And I mean, it was all over my newsfeed. People were DMing me, asking me about it. Are you watching it? Do you think it's great? Um, And I mean, that show is just, it's fantastic. It's beautiful. Uh, It's touching. It has great characters. It's also spooky. Um, It kind of blurs the line of what horror can be, what it should be. Um, Because, I mean, this definitely has scary moments, but I would say the most important thing in that show is the characters. Uh, And most people think that horror is about the blood and the gore and the scares, but I think the best horror really puts the characters first. It makes you feel something. And I think in a nutshell, that's what I love about horror. Um, I I don't like romantic comedies. um, And I like to say that you're more likely to get like decapitated by a serial killer on your way home than to like have two hot guys fall in love with you and fight over you. (laughs) So I think um, what I really appreciate about horror is that it's really honest about life. And You know, it's not afraid to like ask really hard questions and give you some really brutally honest answers. Um, I think it's a really great mirror to ourselves and also to our society. And so, you know, you may ask the question. I asked the question after I had my moment after the Oscars, you know, why is horror so popular now you know what is it about now and not some other time that has people paying attention um and you know i have thoughts about that they could be right they could be wrong we probably won't really know why horror is popular now until we we're looking back on it 10 to 20 years from now um and if you have read my socially acceptable blog. Um, You've heard me talk about some of this. You've read some of this. So I think there are some, there are a few constants in culture that horror continues to resonate with. Um, Some of the issues change, some of the topics change, um, but at its core, humanity does not change. And so We see these cycles in history. We see cycles in human behavior. We see cycles even in art. And so I think this is why sometimes horror is more popular than other times. We're living in a very interesting time right now. Um, I mean, there's just a lot of, just a lot of interesting things going on in our culture. Uh, Some good, some bad, but I think we have some common threads that again, you know, pop up from time to time. And horror resonates with those things in a way that other genres don't. Um, You know, one of the common things is obviously fear. Um, Fear is one of those like primal human emotions that we've had since the beginning, before we had language, before we could really communicate. I mean, fear is, fear and love are probably the base of human emotions. I think probably all of our emotions are built on those two. 
And in that way, you know, horror has always been kind of an outlet for our fear and a reflection of our society. Um, in the 50s and 60s, we had these giant bug movies. And, you know, that was a, an answer to kind of the fear of the atomic age. People were worried we were all going to be blasted off the face of the earth by, you know, the nuclear, like nuclear war, nuclear threats. And so you saw all these like warped bugs that were radioactive. Um, you know, in the 70s, we had, uh, you saw an increase of violence on screen. And that came not long after people started seeing images of Vietnam in their living rooms. It was the first time they had seen like the carnage of war. And so the horror films of the 70s became more violent. Um, and then in the 2000s, you had movies like Hostel. You have, you know, American boys going over to Europe. They're in a foreign land. Foreigners kidnap them and do harm to them. And, you know, there's after 9-11, we had this fear of other countries of leaving our, like, safe American bubble. And um, I think... A lot of today's fears are reflected in Black Mirror, right? We have technology. We're all glued to our technology. We all kind of know it's not good, but we still use it every day. And so the show Black Mirror is tapping into you know that whole thing. And again, I think we're too close to it right now to really understand it. But when people are watching Black Mirror in 10, 20, 30 years... I think they'll be able to look through the lens of time and be like, oh, this is exactly what that was about. Um, I think another reason why maybe we're connected to horror at this point is the nostalgia of it. And I think, you know, um, our culture today is in kind of a state of chaos. And, you know, we want to turn to the things that comfort us. And I think that's why you see, you know, it, Stranger Things are set in the 80s. Um, and they have kids as the main characters. These kids, they're pure, they're innocent. You know, we want to see them win. Um, and it also, it and Stranger Things being set in the 80s, it reminds us of like, you know, a simpler time. And you also see in both of these properties, Stranger Things and it, you see a group of people banding together to overcome a common enemy. And I think right now, with so much division in our culture, that's what people want to see. They want to come together with their friends, with their loved ones, and overcome a common enemy. And I think another thing that resonates with our culture today is the idea of monsters and the other. Um, I think... Well, one of the first monsters in cinema history is Frankenstein. And of course, you know, Frankenstein has become one of the quintessential monsters, and we think of him as scary. But if you watch the movie, the 1931 movie, Frankenstein is really just misunderstood. He was created. He doesn't really know why he was created. He's trying to understand why he was created, and he's trying to understand where he belongs, which that's what every human is trying to do. We're trying to understand why was I put together this way? Why do I have these interests? Why do I have these weaknesses? Why am I the way I am? Why do I look the way I am? And at the end of the day, we all just want to belong. We want to know what our purpose is. And so we identify with a monster such as Frankenstein. In the past, when you see Frankenstein, right, you see monster, other, different, dangerous. But in our culture today, people are seeing Frankenstein the monster as maybe he's just misunderstood. Maybe we need to think about what life is like for him. And so horror has always existed on the fringe of entertainment, but when you take a closer look you see that it holds a surprising amount of truth about humanity and seems to make the most relevant statements about our culture at any given time. And so I think that's why horror has always excelled when society is, 
you know, kind of in an unstable, you know, upheaval type of place. And that's why I think that we are living in quite an interesting time for scary stories. So I am really looking forward to seeing what we get in the next five to 10 years. And I'm also looking forward to kind of sitting back and reflecting on this time when we are 10, 20 years down the road. Um, I think we will see that the horror films of today have a lot of really, really interesting things um, to say about the time that we're living in. Thanks for tuning in. Follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Curoscuro Horror. You can also email me at curoscurohorror at gmail.com. Check out the website, curoscuro.reviews, for the blog and my favorite horror movie recommendations. Talk to you next time.